Вот бойцов. Good afternoon. Thanks for being here today. Today we want to uh, we're going to roll out the uh, the public safety action plan. You know, Alaska. We pride ourselves in all the great st statistics we have, and the largest state, and the three million lakes, and on the list goes on and on. There's one area that we're not so proud of, and that's in uh, public safety. As far as the uh, the stats that we have seen, uh, certainly since 2011, we've seen uh, a rise in crime. Uh, for the fourth year in a row, we are the highest on a per capita basis in the nation in uh, violent crimes. In Alaska, we've seen uh, vehicle thefts increase uh, by nearly 50% in one year. In um, August of this year, I tasked Attorney General Linda Muth to, um, to address this issue, to bring together a, a task force, some concrete plan to uh, action to uh, bring this down. I have with me today, obviously, uh, Department of Law, Attorney General Linda Muth, uh, folks from the Department of Public Safety, Walt Monaghan, uh, Commissioner of Correction, Dean Williams, and Department of Health and Human Services, uh, Commissioner Val Davidson. And they will each speak on their area of, of, uh, of, of focus on this. This is, a <clears throat> this is something that um, um, has been, uh, been, been growing for some time and something that uh, the, the public is very aware of. Uh, obviously, one of the reasons I put uh, Senate Bill 54 on the call was to address this issue, to get this piece of it uh, um, uh, on and uh, taken care of. There'll probably be more uh, steps taken next session uh, on this area as well. I, th I think it's time that we, we focus, rather than focusing on fixing the blame, we need to be focused on fixing the problem. So that's what, uh, that's what we're here about today. One thing we have found out over the past several years, we cannot cut our way into a safer Alaska. This is about making Alaska safer, and we're going to hear more uh, about that with specificity from uh, uh, now. I think uh, it's Attorney uh, General Lindemuth. Thank you. Um, other than our fiscal crisis, public safety is our, our top priority. That's the thing that we have to get right. And I've, I've been in this role for 15 months, and that's one of my things that I've most focused on in, in, as my, in my time as Attorney General, um, especially after uh, bringing Deputy Attorney General Rob Henderson on in March. That's, uh, internally, that's been a big uh, topic of conversation, is how can we, what can we do to improve public safety? After the governor tasked me with putting together a concrete action plan uh, earlier this in the summertime, uh, that our internal discussions became external. We began our outreach to the other agencies, the other, de uh, the other departments, our other law enforcement partners, uh, tribal partners, um, uh, to quite a few folks. And so uh, gathering ideas and putting things together. Now, um, there are a number of factors behind our crime statistics. Uh, the main one that I think that is driving a lot of this is the opioid crisis. And uh, that happened at a time in the last two to three years at the same time that we were making cuts to public safety. And so uh, with those two things and then with um, the economic downturn and uh, obviously when folks are uh, in economic stress, that can also lead to additional crime. So you have all of these things happening in the last uh, you know, three to four years all at the same time. Uh, really, uh, um, so while the, the, the factors that are uh, leading to our crime statistics are multifaceted, our approach to fixing that has to be multifaceted as well. So in addition to holding uh, offenders accountable, we also need to be uh, addressing the underlying causes of crime, including substance abuse and mental health, and also uh, just trying to stem the tide of drugs into our state. Now with that in mind, the action plan focuses on public safety challenge from several directions. And there's four main areas uh, in the plan. And you could have divided this up into, into many different ways, but the way we've approached this in, in, uh, in trying to um, capture this plan is first improving outcomes in our criminal justice system. And obviously SB 54 is a key point of that. The second is identifying public safety resource needs, uh, both adding resources where needed and then making those resources more efficient and effective. Third, improving access to mental health and substance abuse treatment. And then finally, adding and further addressing the opioid epidemic and drug trafficking in our state. 
Now we'll be working together in each of those areas on specific action items in the plan. And even as we take uh, immediate steps, uh, the, the plan also includes longer uh, range issues that we can explore and evaluate uh, both at the Alaska Criminal Justice Commission and with the legislature. But uh, moving forward, this, uh, the, the important point to keep in mind is that this plan is a living document. It's li you know, there's gonna be things added to it and there's gonna be ideas in it that are expanded. Now, um, you know, obviously SB 54 and, and uh, giving additional tools back to our criminal prosecutors in the courts is, is the first step in that plan. But the second piece of it really is adding additional resources back to public safety. Now, our crime statistics have shown that in 2015 and 2016, uh, you know, crime was increasing before then, but it really shot out off the roof in 15 and 16. And uh, that was well before SB 91 was passed. But that, that increase in crime was happening at a time uh, when we had an opioid crisis, but also when we were cutting uh, resources across the state and including in public safety um, departments. And so it was just sort of a perfect storm where those two things were happening at the same time. There's a delay in crime statistics, and so it's one of those things that you don't know what your statistics are until a point when it's too late and you've already made those cuts. Um, but, and then the third part in the plan is to do more uh, with what we have and in creating efficiencies in the way we uh, provide public safety in Alaska, even with the resources that we already have on the ground. But as the governor said, the one thing that's clear is that we cannot cut our way to a safer Alaska. Now, um, in putting this plan together, uh, coordination and collaboration is, is a reoccurring theme, and that's part of the efficiency piece of the plan. Uh, for example, we can do more in sharing data and information among the state agencies, and a lot of this uh, we'll, we'll be focusing on connecting databases and doing more uh, on that. Uh, the second piece, another piece of the uh, collaboration and cooperation is uh, building partnerships and in strengthening our partnerships with other law enforcement agencies. Now many of you were there at the press conference I held two weeks ago with the U.S. Attorney and with the other law, federal law enforcement partners and uh, the, the, at the piece of that uh, that was announced there was the federal anti-crime uh, violent crime strategy and um, that that is uh, an, uh, an action item here is strengthening those partnerships. And as we mentioned at that press conference, uh, those relationships have been in existence for many years, but what we're doing is supercharging it. And so that kind of effort and that kind of supercharging is what we're bringing to the rest of the um, way we're approaching uh, public safety and crime in Alaska. And we're also looking for ways to empower our local communities to do more. I mean, for example, there's uh, the neighborhood watch programs, but we need our communities to be involved in solving uh, crime in the streets. And uh, particularly, we're gonna be focusing on rural communities, and there's more we can do to um, uh, cooperate and, and communicate with our tribal law enforcement partners, with local municipalities, and others who are on the ground in rural Alaska who are uh, at the forefront and often first responders. Um, now, it's easy to get siloed in the way we're approaching public safety. You know, I have Department of Law. Uh, Commissioner Morgan has uh, public um, Department of Public Safety. Uh, Commissioner Williams has uh, Department of Corrections. And we can each be doing our own thing. But what, we're, what this is all about is working together better and putting and doing more with what we have. Commissioner Monaghan. <clears throat> Good morning. You know, we cover a lot of ground, 663,000 square miles to be exact. Hundreds of communities that can only be reached by boat or plane. And then we have to cope with the weather. Weather that sometimes can keep our troopers from getting into communities and at times, unfortunately, for days. To address these inherent logistical challenges, this plan identifies a number of areas where we can be more effective and efficient and connecting our rural communities to the criminal justice system. In particular, we identified simple ways of leveraging, leveraging technology to improve and reach the existing criminal justice resources. As an example, the state currently spends about $2 million every year to transport prisoners from jails to courthouses. Installing more telecommunications resources, especially in rural areas, and using video conferencing when it's appropriate could save 
not only the money, but it can free up our officers to do the things that are, they are also expected to do. Again, some logistical challenges can also be resolved by enabling and working more closely with local authorities. Another example, the plan identifies strengthening our village public safety officer program, or VPSOs, and empowering them perhaps to take on additional responsibilities in their communities, maybe even serving as uh, parole officers. It's another step in that direction. Yet perhaps our biggest challenge is to find enough dedicated men and women to fill our trooper and VPSO ranks. We have step, stepped up our recruiting efforts, but with 43 current trooper vacancies in a 285 trooper authorized force and 34 openings in a 78 authorized VPSO strength, we have a lot of work to do. And this is where every one of you can help. We believe that our state's current unstable budget is a factor in attracting qualified individuals into state service. It's not just the Department of Public Safety, but all our departments within the state. Every one of us are having a difficult time filling our vacancies. And you can help by encouraging your local legislators to address this uneasy situation, who can then vote for fiscal security needed to stabilize this and all future budgets. Let's not ever have to send out those blanket pink slips out anymore. If one thing is clear to all of us, you cannot cut away into making a safer Alaska. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Commissioner, and thank you, Governor. Um, I'd like to um, highlight two things uh, in the plan and also ones that I have been talking about for some time. <clears throat> One is the pretrial enforcement division starts this January. This is a new effort that the state has taken on, an important one in terms of public safety. It does uh, risk assessment for everyone who's remanded in our in custody starting in January and where you're basing, uh, uh, you're making decisions based upon risk and a lot less on based upon money ability to pay bail. So these individuals are already out there being unsupervised, un be un not monitored as we speak right now, today. This new effort in January provides 50 to 60 uh, armed pretrial officers to start assessing them and monitoring them and making sure that they make their court appearances and uh, don't get in trouble again. Like I said before, these people are currently out there, to be very clear, unsupervised, unmonitored right now. So this new effort starts in January. It's a hugely important effort, and it's a new strategy uh, for the state that I think has real promise. The second thing is that my department has recognized that for the last 20 years, uh, we've had a recidivism rate that's completely unacceptable. Two out of three Alaskans who get out of prison return to prison within three years, mostly within the first six months to a year. Um, that should be a, um, a red flag that we have a problem. And I have started talking and addressing as part of this plan, but also before, that two major things I think uh, can combat that. One is that inside the prison walls, we need to have constructive and productive activities. Mm -hmm. There's currently a bill in play in the legislature this year for prison industries. It sounds like something that may not be so important, but I'm telling you it is because you have to have productive time and productive activities. So I think it's an important step towards getting, our handle, uh, getting a handle on recidivism. The second thing I would mention is that um, we have already started work <clears throat> on transitioning uh, inmates, not only just work while they're behind the walls, <clears throat> but also as they're just about ready to get out. We've been in Kenai, for example, we've had uh, a processor we've been working with to have inmates working in their uh, fish processing plant. We've had tremendous success. The governor and I have talked about this a great deal. We think this is a real promising strategy. There was an article in the newspaper just yesterday about the fish processing, the tenuous aspects of the fish processing uh, uh, plant and, and how one of their biggest challenges is employment, finding people to work uh, in their processing plants. And I think this is a real strategy. We've been, we've been kind of dabbling in this area, so we're going to launch a new effort here very soon. Uh, I'm meeting with some uh, major corporation uh, uh, next week about how we expand this effort. And again, um, the reason why that's so important is that you have to have, a, uh, someone getting out has to have a job and a place to live. 
Uh, and this is a, an important strategy that the states have used, and it's, uh, I'm, I'm sure that it's going to be a strategy that's going to help us finally address this recidivism rate that's been bedeviling us for about 20 years. So with those two efforts, uh, those, uh, that's my responsibility. Commissioner? Koyana, Governor Koyana, uh, to my fellow commissioners. Um, one of the things that we know and we've known for some time is that improving access to mental health and substance abuse treatment is really an essential element of our plan to improve public safety. And the plan outlines a number of things, including um, how do we make sure that we can get people evaluated more quickly? How do we make sure that they can access treatment facilities more quickly? And how do we um, realize efficiencies in our existing system? Now. There are some things that we can do that are really sensible adjustments to the legal framework that will allow us to be able to do that. And we can only do that by working together, which is why we are all here today. Um, and the bottom line is we need to make sure that we get people the help that they need when they need it. Not when we think so, but when they think so and when they are ready for treatment. So we know, for example, there are not enough uh, psychiatric treatment beds in Alaska and our civil commitment process needs improvement. Uh, the plan includes addressing that issue. And we're eager to work with our tribes, uh, work with stakeholders, uh, work with our other partners across state government to improve that process. Because right now people are backed up in emergency rooms and what we know is that simply isn't working. We're so thrilled, though, that uh, Governor Walker's decision to expand Medicaid on September 1 of 2015 has made resources available to treatment, and over $43 million in treatment services have been provided through Medicaid expansion, and that has helped tremendously. Um, in terms of increasing uh, treatment, treatment uh, resources available, um, that also includes reaching out to our health partners who are providing some treatment already, those who are interested in uh, expanding their services to provide treatment, and also adding um, designated evaluation and treatment beds. One of the challenges we have in our state is that we have a very large state and a relatively small population. Um, I know for me, I thought um, the village, the community of Bethel with 6,000 people is like the New York City of the region. Um, but, but for most folks in the rest of the, uh, the state, six, a community of 6,000 people isn't really all that large. But we know that our state right now is really heavily reliant on treatment programs that really only exist uh, for the large part in, um, in larger urban communities. And what we've learned is that without more options available at the local community level, um, we know we're going to see longer wait lists and shorter treatment programs at the few facility, at fewer facilities. We also know that a healthy community is a state community, is a safe community, and Alaskans can't get healthy and address addictions without adequate to, without adequate access to treatment facilities in your home community. And we've seen that happen in the opioid epidemic. It's a driving force behind our crime statistics and the public safety action plan affirms that the Department of Health and Social Services will continue leading the effort to implement the state strategic plan for responding to the opioid crisis as was outlined in the Alaska Opioid Policy Task Force. And I think we certainly have learned the hard lesson that Alaska simply cannot cut our way to a safer Alaska. With that, Governor. Well, thank you. A couple of closing comments on the on the fiscal situation. Obviously, there's two issues uh, that are on the on the call. I think they're intertwined. I think we've seen that. We've heard that today. How one does affect the other. Um, we do need a full fiscal plan. We have we have done the hard work. The legislature, uh, administration, uh, working together, uh, reducing the budget. We reduced spending by uh, 1.7 billion dollars, uh, about 44 percent reduction. Um, you know, I was recently, I travel a lot in this position, and I'm very fortunate to be able to do that, travel around our state. And um, on Alaska Day, I was in Sitka, and I, uh, as, which I would highly recommend to, to, to everybody. It's, it's a pretty amazing celebration that takes place there every year. But as part of that, I went to the Trooper Academy. 
and I spoke to the, there were about 15 that were there, about five of them were, were uh, uh, with the DPS and the others were municipal folks going through the academy. And so when I got done speaking, I asked for questions. Uh, does there anybody have a question of the governor? And one question, one question that was asked, uh, and the person was a little, a little bit uh, nervous asking the question because his training and officers were, were behind there, so he, but he said, you know, governor, the day after I started training, my wife called me. She'd received uh, in the mail the pink slip notice of my position. She said, he said, are we going to continue to see this? That a year again, again and again and again that we're going to see the pink slips in, in, the, in the mail. And I, 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 I gave him every assurance I could uh, for as much as I can do that that won't, that won't happen again. You know, Alaska, Alaska needs fiscal certainty. They need to know, looking out into the future, they aren't going to have another series of, of pink slips upon pink slips upon pink slips. So we're sort of, I mean, we're not alone in, 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 in recognizing the problem. The, the bond rating agencies, when we're sitting a third from the bottom, uh, only in New Jersey and, and uh, uh, Illinois uh, below us, that's not a good place to be. So it's not, it's not just us. Others are observing this. We need to fix this problem. It's all within our, all the tools we have are available to us to fix the problem. We need to fix it. We need to fix it now. I don't want to face, or anybody else, face another group of, 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 of uh, young women and men training to put their life on the line asking questions about, are we going to get a pink slip uh, in, uh, uh, in, in May or June of this year again? That's, that has to be something of the past. So I, I, I asked the legislature back to... Uh, to address this, to address it on a on a uh, uh, full fiscal plan, uh, you know. Recently, I was at um, a municipal league conference in in um, um, Haines, and they talked about this fiscal situation as well. We had asked every, uh, to put it in perspective, the $14 billion that's been drawn down from the savings to continue to, to, uh, to, to operate the government. Uh, that's equivalent to about six times what every municipality submitted to us as far as on the top three capital projects as part of President Trump's um, uh, plan of infrastructure. Every municipality submitted the plan, their, what their wish lists were for three, their top three. That came out at $2.5 billion. We've gone through $14 billion. It's time we, we close out this fiscal uh, gap and, and be done with it and, and, and move on. So I'm, I, am, um, I am employing the, uh, the legislature during its 54 uh, is being t uh, addressed now, and let's get right, ba right back with uh, uh, the fiscal situation. So with that, it's been, I know it's been a long press conference. I've had a lot of help today, but there was a reason for that because uh, this is a team approach, and so now we'll, we're happy to take questions. James. Governor, what will you request for public safety in December in your budget, and how will it be paid for? Well, we are in the process of putting that budget together, so I don't have a specific number, James, but I, uh, that's a, it's a, we know that we cannot continue to reduce and cut and cut and expect um, a, a safer Alaska, so uh, I, I don't have a specific number, but we're going to take that in consideration. Higher than last year? I, I don't know that. I, when I, when that, when that, that department brings their budget to me, I'll, I will look at that. Uh, holistically and is based upon not just the budget was last year and this year, but really what, what Alaska deserves, what Alaska is asking for in, in the way of uh, public safety. Liz? Uh, Governor Liz Rains with KTVA. This action plan outlines specific goals for each department, and I'm wondering what's the time frame in which Alaskans can expect um, to see these tasks accomplished by your administration? So, Attorney General John Alendemir, there are many things in here, and some of these things are immediate, and others will be a longer range plan. So, this is something that we're going to keep uh, working, working the plan, and, and meeting regularly with the commissioners and, and others at, in our departments who are responsible for these items. But there's not, uh, there's no one thing that you know we're going to accomplish all of this by X date. This is this is an ongoing, as I said, a living document that will have um, additional changes and things. But we're we're paying attention now, and there are things in here that are immediate. Could you just give us a couple of examples of like what's happening right now? Andrew. Hey, Andrew Kitchenman, Alaska Public Radio Network. Um, I, I, my question is, do you have any concrete steps or ideas as to how to fill the uh, funded uh, officer positions that uh, are currently unfilled? Thank you. Well, Monaghan DPS. Actually, uh, the I'm fortunate I've got the two directors of the both the Alaska State Troopers and the Wildlife Troopers, and they have been working with their staff to look for innovative ways in stepping up our recruiting um, issues. 
We've put more money into it. We're traveling more to uh, different places where we might find individuals. But there's also a hope, too, that we're going to look inside the state. Uh, candidly, I know there are good qualified individuals within the state. We just have to make the environment not only inviting and, and possible and accessible, but we have to make it comfortable. And the comfortable part, it goes back to what the governor said, we don't want to have any pink slips. And uh, the state right now it isn't a, doesn't attract a lot of good people as it should but we are we are working on a, a huge plan okay grace governor we've got some uh, reporters on the phone we'll go first to austin baird um austin go ahead and unmute hey uh governor or whoever would be the best to answer this i wonder how can you afford more and better mental health services and substance abuse treatment when you're simultaneously uh, pushing to increase the number of people in hard jail beds as Senate Bill 54 would. And also, some people do bristle at the idea of Medicaid expansion funds supporting people who are newly released from prison in any way, and I wonder if uh, anyone from the administration would have a response to that sort of concern. Okay, thanks, Austin. Val and, and uh, Dean. So I'll um, speak to the first question first. Um, this is Val Davidson, Commissioner of the Department of um, Health and Social Services. So there are a number of things that we can and have done um, to be able to seek additional sources, uh, to be able to provide for services that we know that we need in Alaska. So for example, uh, in 2007, the Department of Health and Social Services, with the support of Governor Walker, applied for and received a number of federal grants from the Substance Abuse Mental Health uh, Services Administration um, to be able to provide for more medication-assisted treatment, working with our partners at the Department of Corrections, um, and also other opportunities to be able to develop local capacity to be able to provide more treatment. Um, the legislature also, um, a couple of years ago, uh, provided resources to be able to provide more treatment services, and we're seeing that happen, um, and really be able to provide treatment services at the local level. So a part of it is being more creative about the opportunities to be able to look elsewhere through federal resources to be able to do that. Um, speaking of federal resources, one of those great opportunities is Medicaid expansion, because it is mostly, in fact, almost entirely funded by federal funds. Uh, we have been, the Department of Health and Social Services has been working with our partners at the Department of Corrections. I didn't know if Commissioner Williams wanted to come up and speak about the opportunities where uh, when someone is leaving um, a correctional facility, if they have the opportunity to be able to go into treatment or better aftercare, to be able to support the services that they, they've received in a correctional facility, we know we're going to have better outcomes as a state. Yeah, um, Austin, Dean Williams, the Commissioner for Corrections. Um, I would just add on to Val, and I hope I answer your question, but one of this is really getting our head around what the strategy should be, and these things really, really matter. Um, uh, th through the governor's leadership, we got chosen to go to a, a two-day learning lab that Rob Henderson and I went to and others went to about what other states and other counties have done back east in terms of dealing with the opioid issue. So one of the things we've been working on is really the strategy of people being released <clears throat> and what you do with them when they're heroin addicts. And so some of this is going to require money, but a lot of this, I've told my department, um, we're going to switch strategies, um, and the money will follow the strategies. And so I have thrown a lot of things that traditionally we have done back on the table. And so Vivitrol Behind the Walls is one strategy is very important. Uh, we have up to about 70 individuals who have gotten their first Vivitrol shot in our facilities uh, going out. Well, we're not exactly, there's a whole study about, about uh, following them to see how they do, but that's the start of the kind of things I think we need to do in terms of really realigning efforts and not just doing what we were doing before as you face this sort of opioid crisis. And so I hope I've answered your question. And if I may follow up on that, one of the things that was also really helpful was the passage of Senate Bill 74. Um, and I see the sponsor of that here today, so Ruyana, for that bill. And it was really comprehensive Medicaid reform and really looks at are we um, aligning our behavioral health services accurately? When we're talking about where we put resources, we want to make sure that folks have access to resources sooner rather than later. And so there are a lot of things that we can do with existing resources or with resources that, uh, that are not state resources, like federal resources. 
Thanks, Commissioner. Next is Nat Hers. Nat, go ahead and unmute your line. Nat, sorry, can you repeat yeah. that? Can you guys hear me now? Yep. Okay. Um, yeah, thanks. Um, I'm wondering for, for each of the agency representatives or agency heads that are here, can you name two specific things at your agency, like specific services that will be provided to Alaskans that will be different today or tomorrow or next week because of this plan that you're announcing today? Or is this really more like a wish list of things that you guys want in the future but basically can't pay for it until there's like a physical plan or something like that? Okay, I'll have each one uh, address specifics. Uh, Nat Hertz, this is John Alindemuth, Attorney General. You're right, there is a tie to this and that there's there's the need for fiscal certainty because public safety costs dollars. And so for law, what we the, the main thing that we would be adding um, is we're asking for five more prosecutors, including one uh, w which would be a statewide drug prosecutor that would be uh, um, embedded with our DPS uh, task force on that and working closely with that um, task force. So you're right that there, we do need additional resources um, and that that is something that, that we're doing. But as far as non-dollar things, we can do communication and collaboration better. And so we're working with uh, putting together a communication plan f uh, for across Alaska. Obviously, we know where the, um, the troopers and the VPSOs are, but there's other law enforcement out there, and we want to make sure we have those contacts in place for all of our DAs and all of our rural uh, locations so that they know who, you know, if there's a village that doesn't have a VPSO or a trooper there, who's the contact person for that village? So those are the things that we're working on immediately that don't cost money. Commissioner Monaghan. Thank you, sir. <clears throat> Walt Monaghan, uh, DPS again. The two things that we can, we're looking at that we can accomplish fairly quickly is we're going to assign two uh, investigators into the Department of Law in the areas of domestic violence, sexual assault, and uh, they will be following up with them and working with them as, a, as part of their team. And the other thing that we could do is that uh, working with the grantees on the VPSO program, that we can uh, use some of the money that's currently in the um, vacant positions to help bolster their efforts in assisting them as partners to get more uh, applicants in the uh, for the vacancies that we have at VPSOs. So those two things. Thank you. Mr. Williams. Yep. Uh, Annette, Dean Williams. Um, I guess one, and let me two things. One, let me go back to what I was, my comments earlier is that uh, I really need stability about this pretrial enforcement effort. So I suppose that's not a change, but I guess it's, it's an ongoing change that I need to have full stability of. So when I hear things about uh, fully repeal, um, what we had just done, um, <clears throat> that is throwing out the baby with the bathwater, in my opinion, because I need stability in this effort to let's try this because in every other state, here's what's really important happened. Public safety in every other state where pretrial enforcement division has been stood up has improved. More people make it to their court appearances and less people get in trouble from the time that they're arrested on their first charge to the time their court trial uh, concludes. That's in every other state. And so I need that to go forward with some stability in my staff to know that's going to happen. So that may not be a change, but I guess I'm asking for a change in sort of approaches that, that this is something we're committed to. The second thing, and I won't want to get ahead of my plans, but there's some really promising uh, conversations I'm having th uh, in with private companies now about uh, inmate employment and what that should look like this next year. And if I can, the governor's goal on this is probably larger than mine, which is good uh, to give me that sort of clearance. But there is a huge opportunity here to, need, to meet a private um, industry need and do the right thing uh, in terms of uh, reducing our recidivism rate. It's the best example of what could be a public-private partnership that I've seen in a long time. I've been in government a long time. And so um, it's really giving the clearance <clears throat> from the governor uh, as part of this plan to really make sure that, yep, you have the clearance to go ahead. So that would be the two things I would mention. Thank you. Commissioner Davidson. 
Koyana Val Davidson again, Department of Health and Social Services. I'll just mention two things. In terms of treatment, um, we know that there are folks in Alaska who are providing treatment, who are interested in, in treatment, but they don't have a payer because of a long standing federal rule called the Prohibition on the Institutions for Mental Disease, uh, the IMD rule. And that rule says that if your treatment facility has more than 16 beds, you cannot bill Medicaid. And um, in other states where they have larger uh, community or they have lots of um, facilities across a number of communities, that makes sense. In Alaska, um, having a larger facility actually has better treatment outcomes. We're able to provide services more efficiently. And so we are working with our federal counterparts to be able to do an, uh, an to request a waiver for that requirement so that um, we can um, we can reimburse providers who uh, are providing their services in a larger facility that is more than 16 beds. The other is we also recognize that there are many, many paths to recovery. And uh, while inpatient may be appropriate for some folks, outpatient treatment may be the answer for others. And we are looking at expanding our medica medication-assisted treatment, uh, whether it's naloxone, whether it's naltrexone, to be able to ensure that folks who are ready for treatment and who are interested in outpatient treatment have the services that are available for them. And Governor, since we're already past time, there's one more reporter on Dan Joling of Associated Press. Can you make your answer quick, Dan? No questions. Okay, okay. thank you. Let me, before you. Let me just use my, my governor, governor prerogative to respond to a, a comment made by Commissioner Davidson. I was pleased to hear President Trump last week specifically speak to that 16-bed limitation. So I think you're going to be pleased with uh, the waiver you've asked for because I think it's uh, – uh, he, has, he has helped in that regard specifically. So it's nice to be on the same, sort of on the same um, um, path uh, on the state side with the federal side on that, because that's one thing he spoke specifically for. So with that, thank you. Uh, thanks, everybody. Thanks very much.